Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our October Security Health Plan Academy presentation. This month, we are focusing on a crucial topic, cancer screening and early detection. Today's webinar will provide an overview of common cancers and screening tests to aid in early detection. We are fortunate to have Dr. Michael Husack from Marshfield Clinic Health System with us to present this important information. Dr. Husack graduated from the Medical College of Pennsylvania in 1982 and brings over 40 years of experience in the medical field, specializing in adult oncology and hematology. Currently, Dr. Husack sees patients in the Rice Lake area. Before we begin, a friendly reminder to keep your microphones muted throughout the presentation to minimize distractions. We understand that this topic may raise some uh, remain, uh, may raise many questions, so please feel free to submit them via the chat feature located toward the bottom of your screen, and we will address as many as we can before the scheduled end time. Please know that if we are unable to respond to your question during the live presentation, we will provide an answer in the follow-up communication scheduled for later this month. We are grateful to Dr. Husek for taking the time to join us today, especially between his patient appointments in Rice Lake. So uh, without further ado, let's dive in and get started. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And I'd like to present, you know, this topic uh, somewhat briefly and not, or, you know, comprehensively because I think the question and answers are probably more important at the end. So I'm anticipating some questions and uh, controversy. So um, we're gonna give a brief, overview and again not comprehensive but our main objectives today would be to provide an overview of what cancer is review the common cancer this meeting is being recorded discuss screening options and by screening options we mean preventative measures we can do to prevent cancer or to catch it early and review the importance of early detection uh, next slide. So the basic question is, what is cancer? And very simply, cancer is any type of disease process that produces a mutation in a cell and causes damage to the body or the host. So if you, this is a very simplified picture, but if you look at a normal cell in, and it behaves in a normal fashion, replicates normally, lives a normal lifespan, will die, and for new cells will be produced. And this, the basic damage is done to the DNA. And when you, you hit damage the DNA, and if it's damaged in a crucial spot, it can be, result in a defective cell, and this cell multiplies. Now, the problem is that the cells multiply too fast or they don't know how to die. So um, we have a little, they just accumulate and be, become, develop tumors. And that's kind of what we see on CAT scans. We develop these abnormal tumors uh, that we see on CAT scan or even visually you can see on your skin, such as a melanoma or a lymphoma, which you'll see an abnormal lymph gland. So basically it's a mutation in the DNA, which causes cancer. Next step, next slide. So we'll go to the first common, you know, the most common cancer in women is breast cancer. And that seems to be what women fear the most in general. So I, it is the most common cancer in women. It counts for 30% of all new female cancers every year. Men occasionally will get breast cancer, but quite rarely, maybe 1% of all breast cancers are in men. And they're about, if you look at the second uh, bullet point there, about 297,000 new cancer, new cases of invasive breast cancer will be diagnosed in women. Now there's two types of breast cancer. One is we call non-invasive breast cancer and the other is invasive breast cancer. So we get 55,720 new cases of 
ductal carcinoma in site two, which is the non-invasive breast cancer. By that we mean it's I kind of when women ask me about that, I say it's kind of like a polyp. You know, it hasn't invaded your body, but it's abnormal cells that accumulate, and we can see these on mammograms. And eventually we think about 15 to 25 percent of these will eventually develop into breast cancer given enough time. And the next bullet point says about 43,700 case uh, women will die of breast cancer this year. So looking at it in total, if you look at your average risk, there's an average risk in the U.S. of developing breast cancer of about 13%. And this means that there's a one in eight chance a woman will develop breast cancer. This also means that there is a seven in eight chance that a woman will never have the disease. Next slide. So what, what are the risk factors for breast cancer? And by risk factors, we mean either hereditary environmental factors that can increase your risk of developing breast cancer. Now, remember, you have a one in eight chance of developing breast cancer overall. But if you look at the risk factors, that'll, that'll increase your chance of developing breast cancer. And some of the common risk factors that we know about are obviously number one, being female. Number two, obesity. Number three, lack of exercise. Number four, excessive alcohol consumption. Number five, hormone replacement therapy. And that was a big topic because about maybe 30, 40 years ago, a lot of women were going through menopause and the treatment was, well, let's get more female hormone. And so what we noticed that after about 10, 15 years, uh, a lot of uh, increased risk of developing breast cancer occurred. So we would see more women with breast cancer on hormone therapy. So that practice of giving women hormones to help with menopause symptoms uh, declined rather dramatically when that data came out. Any, and basically anything that increases your estrogen exposure during your lifetime will increase um, your risk. So if you have early onset menstruation, or if you have children at an older age, if you break up your cycle, that seems to decrease your risk of uh, developing breast cancer. And obviously another very important part is the family history. So we know that if your family history is positive for breast cancer or ovarian cancer, that you have an increased risk of developing breast cancer. And we do more and more genetic testing on women, especially young women, to see if there's a genetic component to developing breast cancer. Uh, next slide. So how, how do we prevent breast cancer or detect it early? Well, there's, you know, detecting it early is our main, one of our main goals, and we know that it's effective. So, and the main goal, main tool we use is mammograms. So there's some controversy, but I think it's fairly well settled that we'll start screening women at age 40 through the age of 75. That's somewhat controversial because obviously women are now living to 90 and 100. So, um, whether to stop at age 75 is controversial. Whether to start at age 40 or 50, um, somewhat controversial also, but I think we've decided on 40 at this point. Obviously, if, if your mother or sister developed breast cancer at age 30, we generally advise that you start screening five to 10 years before that, since your family history is kind of telling us that you have a risk of developing breast cancer at an early age. So besides mammograms, we do clinical breast exams, either self-breast exams or your doctor will do a breast exam. Usually it's done at the same time as you get your mammogram. If your mammogram shows that you have dense breasts, and it should show on that report whether you have dense breasts, and they'll say heterogeneously dense breasts or extremely dense breasts, then sometimes your doctor will recommend a breast MRI. About 5% of the time, we pick up 
uh, breast cancers on breast MRI that were missed on mammograms. And this is typically when the uh, mammogram shows extremely dense breasts. If we hear, have an area of concern on a mammogram, then sometimes we'll recommend a breast ultrasound, which can give us another layer of granularity to detecting these abnormal mammograms. And those are non-invasive uh, tests that uh, we can maybe sometimes spot something that is somewhat kind of difficult to see on a mammogram or even on a breast MRI. Now, mammograms and are not without some risk, you know, so you do get some radioactivity when you do mammograms, but there's always a risk benefit calculation. So, and overall, we think, you know, there's a, there's a much greater benefit to getting mammograms as opposed to a risk. Breast MRI, on the other hand, uh, does not have any uh, radioactivity. It's uh, basically magnets, so you should be, you know, it doesn't add any increased risk developing breast cancer. Then obviously if there's abnormal if the abnormality is strong enough, we recommend a biopsy. And then depending on what the biopsy shows, your doctor will make a referral for further surgery or um, further diagnostic tests to evaluate that. Any questions at all? I, I, I don't mind interrupting my talk. So if somebody has an urgent question or wants to have clarification on a point, I'd be glad to uh, Please, um, you know, ask, and now we can expound on these. But if everything's okay, we'll go on to the next slide. We don't have any um, questions yet in the chat feature, so you can keep moving. Okay. And we will, I will monitor. Okay. So the next uh, common uh, cancer in women is cervical cancer. Now, uh, cervical cancer affects women of all ages. Obviously, we're looking at, you know, women of reproductive age and, and older. The disease often presents with no symptoms in its early stages, which is why it's often referred to as one of the silent killers. And that's why we do pap smears. Cervical cancer is the easiest gynecologic cancer to prevent with regular screening tests and follow-up. And by screening tests, again, they mean, you know, a physical exam, GYN exam, and pap tests. Most cervical cancers are caused by the human papilloma virus, a common virus that can be passed from one person to another through sexual activity. And it's the fourth most common type of cancer for women worldwide. Now, the good news is, is that we have a vaccine for human papilloma virus, uh, which maybe has been around for 20 years or so. So now we're recommending that all women starting at age around 12, you know, or when they start having periods or becoming sexually active, that they have a, a human papilloma virus vaccine. And now, there's, originally there was not enough vaccine to go around, but now I think our age cutoff is about age 45. Okay. Human papilloma virus is not only caused cervical cancer, but it now it's causing about 40 to 50% of all head and neck cancers and anal cancers. So it's a, a pretty common can, uh, cancer causing virus. It's not the only one, but you know, it's the one that we have a vaccine for and, and, and we can prevent for the most part. Next slide. Now, what are the risk factors for cervical cancer? Well, we know that we talked about the, his, the you know, human papilloma virus. And we know that, if, say, like on a GYN exam, if there's an abnormal uh, looking cervix, then we do further testing on that to see if, the, if that human papilloma virus is present. And if it is, you know, we can remove part of the abnormal cells there in the cervix. Now, the other risk factors are multiple sexual partners. These are all pretty self-explanatory. You know, intercourse at an early age, history of sexually transmitted infections, and smoking. Next slide. And so how do we screen for cervical cancer? Again, uh, the pap test, pap smear, 
It's the most reliable and effective cancer screening test available. The test is done in the doctor's office or a clinic that looks for precancer cell changes on the cervix. I got it reading. Yeah, I can't see the end of that slide. I'm not sure if I can move this over. Yeah, there we go. Okay, the test is carried out at a doctor's office or clinic to screen for the HPV virus. The test is usually done during a pelvic exam where the doctor takes a sample of cervical cells. The cells are then sent to a lab to check for the presence of HPV. And our recommendation now is women who are 21 to 29 should have a pap test done every three years. HPV testing alone can be considered for women who are 25 to 29, but PEP tests are preferred. And women who are 30, 65 have three options for testing. They can have a PAP smear. A PAP, uh, they can have a PAP test and HPV test every five years. Next slide. The next cancer, now this one is a little different, affects both men and women equally. And together, it's the third most common cancer diagnosed in both men and women. And with regular screenings, the colorectal cancer is preventable. So if found, the five-year survival rate is more than 90%. If found early, the five-year survival rate is more than 90%. 70% of early onset cases have no known risk factors such as family history of colorectal cancer. Next slide. Now, who's at risk for colorectal cancer? And for the most part, we're looking at uh, people of older age, people have a personal family history of colorectal cancer or polyps certain types of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, hereditary syndromes such as Lynch syndrome. There's also familial polyposis syndrome and type two diabetes. In general, diabetes causes an increased risk of, you know, almost all cancers. So if you're, di if you're diabetic, for some reason, you're, you um, have an increased risk of a lot of different cancers. Next slide. So our screening for colorectal cancer uh, basically is all adults age 45 to 75. And obviously those with a family history are at higher risk and need to be screened earlier than age 45. And say like you have a first degree relative that developed colon cancer at age 30, then you would need to be screened five to 10 years earlier than that. And the screening tests we have, there are multiple ones. Obviously, colonoscopy may be the gold standard, but a lot of people do not like to go through a colonoscopy. So we, you know, we've tried other ways to get around colonoscopies. The other reason is we just don't have enough manpower to do colonoscopies on every patient. Also, so it's always a, you know, we're always looking for simpler ways to screen for colon cancer. So you have the uh, test you can take at home to check for blood in your in your colon. It's a text collection kit that can be done at home. It's a fecal occult blood test called the FIT test. It can be done yearly or a Cologuard test, which is done every three years. The Cologuard test is a little different. It tests for DNA. Now, if you have a, a cancer in your colon, the DNA the cancerous DNA or the tumor DNA gets excreted into the feces and it can be picked up on the Cologuard test. A sigmoidoscopy is not optimum, but you know it's fairly e it's easier to perform. It can be done in clinic or hospital setting, and it's recommended every five years. A colonoscopy, again, is uh, probably the gold standard it can be formed in a performed in a clinic or hospital setting and recommend testing every 10 years. Or your doctor will tell you if he sees some polyps or some abnormal changes, he may suggest you come back in three years or five years or maybe even one year. Uh, CT colonography is another way to get around doing a colonoscopy and that's done like a CT scan. Again, it's performed in a clinic or hospital setting and recommend testing every five years. 
Next slide. Cancer prevention. Okay, so if, if we look at, you know, globally, how to prevent cancer, you know, um, I like to think of cancer as uh, kind of a two-prong uh, situation here where you may have a hereditary predisposition to cancer, but you can't change that. You know, you're born that way. Uh, you may have uh, a BRCA1, BRCA2 mutation or Lynch syndrome, other different syndromes will predispose you to developing certain cancers. So uh, that we can't change, but we certainly can change their environmental factors. Um, so we can do screen cancer screening. We can stay away from tobacco. We know that tobacco is an increased risk of head and neck cancer, you know, esophageal cancers, bladder cancers. You know, eat healthy and get active. Be safe in the sun. You know, not you don't want to have too much sun, and you can protect against HPV with regular screenings or the vaccine. And there are numerous other methods. You know, you, know, you can do. You know, if if you you know, a lot of times you'll see in the news or on uh, TV where they found that you can decrease your risk of breast cancer by drinking one glass of wine, a, you know, one glass of wine a day, or not drinking two glasses of wine a day, or there's always something in the news about decreasing risk of, of cancer. So it's a common topic. And some of these are, you know, you have to take with a grain of salt, but, you know, just, you know, like these on the picture, you know, you know, they look like two healthy adults who are enjoying life and, you know, exercising and, you know, not overweight, and, um, you know, just getting outdoors. And, you know, so that's, you know, a good picture to take home. Next slide. Early detection is key. Yeah, obviously, if if um, you know, be, you know, if you besides prevent, prevention, if you can catch things early, it's much easier to cure things when caught early. So, you know, routine cancer screening can detect cancer early. And this, we we didn't talk about some of these like skin cancer. You know, just check your skin if you see an abnormal mole you know, bleeding or something doesn't look right on your skin, have it checked out. You know, we, we didn't talk about prostate cancer, but, you know, PSA tests, you know, talk to your doctor about doing the PSA test. So, you know, there's, those are the common, you know, very common cancers that you can protect. Certain cancers you'll never be able to detect early, like leukemia or lymphoma. So by the time it becomes symptomatic, it's, you know, stage four, but you know, certainly treatable. And it's the next bullet point is fairly intuitive. Most cancers, if you catch it early, it increases your chance of survival. And then the next bullet is early detection of cancer may require less extensive treatment or allow for more treatment options. So you're not going to be in the hospital for months at a time getting treatments if you catch it early. Next slide. So in this presentation, we have reviewed what cancer is and how it starts, discussed common cancers. And again, we didn't include all the cancers, but uh, you know, um, the big ones we missed were probably you know melanoma, skin cancers, and uh, uh, prostate cancer. Uh, we discussed ways in which people can obtain cancer screening. And this is always a discussion with your doctor. You know, uh, you can ask them, well, what you know. You should, you know, a good way is to go over your family history. If there's significant family history there, we can do genetic testing, you know, and if there's not a strong family history, then we can recommend screening tests. They can catch cancer early before it causes problems for you. And again, we review the benefits of early detection. Next slide. So I think we've concluded. And so with that, uh, I think we'll take questions. All right, thank you so much, um, Dr. Husak. I am going to start by asking a question we received um, when we were talking about breast cancer. The uh, um, audience member is asking, what about, um, you had talked about that we stopped screening after age 75. And I think we're wondering, well, what 
what do we do for women over the age of 75 since we are no longer screening? Yeah. Well, you know, my theory is if um, I, I look at, is your lifespan going to be less than 10 years or longer than 10 years? So if you're 75 and your parents live to be 100, I would say let's continue screening, you know, till later age. On the other hand, if you're 75 with a poor performance status, you know, and, you know, your life expectancy is, you know, less than five years, the benefit of, uh, of mammograms are probably limited. And so it would just be, you know, self-exams periodically. Um, you know, if there's any problems, you know, you'd have it checked out and maybe do a mammogram at that point, you know, but um, so that would be, that, that would be the main uh, criteria. But again, I look at more like life expectancy versus, uh, you know, versus age, you know, and I think we're getting away as we're living longer. I think we're getting away. More doctors are, you know, looking at life expectancy, but, you know, again, you still have some doctors say, well, you're 75 and guidelines say that we should stop screening for breast cancer. Um, so but not totally wrong, but I kind of look at life expectancy more. My view, because okay. we, because we, you know, we see a lot of women that are ninety years old with breast cancer, you know, and um, you know, I, um, so they need to be treated and evaluated. So, okay. The next question I have for you was submitted in advance of today's webinar, and it is. My husband had an elevated PSA in 2018 and wasn't tested again until we just found out he has cancer. Should he have received more screening tests earlier? Well, you know, the, I've looked at a couple guidelines and uh, the PSA of 2.5 seems to be the limit there. So if, if you have a PSA over 2.5, it probably should be checked again the following year. And then if it increases, check again the following year. And then, you know, if it still is increasing and some uh, physicians use four as a, as a normal level, if it's over four, then referral to urology for a biopsy. And obviously another thing is a digital rectal exam. So if you have a PSA of 2.5 and the doctor feels a lump on your prostate, then you probably should get a immediate referral. So, uh, you know, that question, I guess it depends on what his PSA was. If it's, uh, if it's, obviously, if his PSA was 10, then I would be more concerned and, and may, immediate, maybe get immediate referral to urology. There are benign conditions that cause an elevated PSA, such as prostatitis and infection of the prostate gland. Okay, the next question we received, could loss of several large tufts of facial and head hair be related to a specific health condition? Yeah, that's that's not normal. You know, when, uh, some, when people come in and tell me they're losing hair, uh, is, has there been any trauma or stress in their life that could have precipitated that? Uh, have their thyroids been checked, you know? And some, uh, there are a category of cancers that cause what we call perineoplastic syndrome, which is the cancer produces substances that make people feel tired, weak, fatigued, uh, maybe get hair loss. Uh, we call it alopecia. But I think the dermatologist would probably be the next step if you lost, we're losing hair and just to have them evaluate further what's going on with the hair loss. It could be something as simple as a, you know, inflammatory condition or it could be treated, you know. Uh, but um, certainly there are multiple conditions that can cause hair loss. One of them is cancer, but probably not the most common. All right, let's take a look at another question. Lynch syndrome runs in my family. What screening test should be done for this condition and when? Yeah, that's a very complicated question. You know, um, sorry to hear that you have Lynch syndrome in your family, but um, the first thing to do would be tested, you know, have yourself tested for Lynch syndrome. And then if you test positive, Lynch syndrome is a 
uh, problem. It's a mutation where your body cannot repair DNA damage properly. So you get, you know, we the thinking is that everybody has damaged cells, but your body can take care of it. But with Lynch syndrome, they can't seem to take care of it. So over time, your body accumulates bad cells, cancer cells. Now, the more common here, Lynch syndrome can cause an increased risk of multiple breast cancers, but the most common ones we think of are endometrial cancer, in other words, uterine cancer, stomach cancer, GI cancer, but it also can cause an uh, increased risk of breast ovarian cancer. So, what you know, so common screening strategies I use are, you know, a urine cytology or check the urine for abnormal blood cells or referral to a urology if there are some abnormal cells present. You know, we also will we'll also recommend doing an upper endoscopy to look for stomach cancer and esophageal cancer. The uh, breast cancer is an increased risk, but I don't necessarily do anything more than the regular uh, breast mammograms. Uh, skin cancer, slight increased risk, so just be careful with skin cancers also. So there, it's a, it's a not unusual problem, and I think in the last 10 years been recognized more, and screening tests have been a little more individualized, and and we've been more aggressive with screening. But if you have Lynch syndrome, then I would certainly recommend you see an oncologist or have your primary care doctor be aware of the problems with Lynch syndrome and um, or have the geneticist, you know, make recommendations. Yeah, that's a, and that's where early prevention can make a difference. Okay. And another question we received, what should be included in annual exams after age 65 besides listening to the lungs and review of medications? Are there specific items we should ask our providers to include during our annual exams to prevent late cancer detection? Things like breast exams, rectal exams, reflexes, balance checks, additional lab tests, skin screening, neuro changes, et cetera. Sure. Yeah, no, that's a complicated question, you know, but... You know, and I probably, you know, we, we kind of think of it as intuitive, but as you get older, you're at risk for mul multiple things. And one of the things is breast cancer, you know, but like for instance, breast cancer, you know, we see breast cancer at all age groups, you know, but more common, and your risk of developing breast cancer goes up exponentially as you get older. So you're more likely to get breast cancer at age 60, 70, 80 than, than you are at age 30, you know. And usually, I didn't bring this up, but most uh, young cancers or cancers in young people are hereditary. So if you're, you know, we look, that's kind of a red flag. So if you get cancer at a young age, then we kind of think of hereditary syndromes. Whereas the, you know, as you get older, we're looking more at environmental, viral, Know, uh, issues. So, you know, obviously at over age 65, you know, we would continue your breast cancer screening tests, uh, breast cancer exams. The PSA would be an important part of the testing for men. You know, uh, digital rectal exam would also be an important part you know, of testing. Colonoscopies, again, you know, increased risk as you get older of colon cancer. Um, and then discussion about healthy lifestyle, you know, obviously stop smoking, you know, drink, you know, drink in moderation. I think we're still recommending one drink a day, but, you know, even that's somewhat questionable, but, um, and healthy lifestyle, you know, weight loss, uh, exercise, you know, uh, COVID-19 kind of threw everything into a tailspin. We couldn't, you know, people weren't screening because, you know, uh, the pandemic so we kind of were starting to catch up with a lot of that so we should be getting back on track but um yeah and you know so and just in the future you know this is kind of futuristic but you know we may end up coming up with a blood test you know checking what we call circulating tumor dna which is uh we just do a blood test and if we see 
tumor DNA in your bloodstream, well, now we can maybe go look and look and do more testing, you know, then again, not ready for prime time or not, you know, not something you would, your doctor would do at this point, but it's something that, you know, maybe in the future, we're going to have a blood test that's going to tell us, well, we're, you know, you have cancer and we got to do something about it. But hopefully, because our, our, we're getting more, more and more sophisticated with our DNA testing, you know, our gen, both our genetic testing and our monitoring for cancer or detecting cancer early. So, um, and that'd be nice. So we wouldn't have to do mammograms or colonoscopies anymore. Obviously, they're burdensome for people and, um, you know, can cause some risks also. All right. We're a little bit over time. Um... I'm going to ask one more question and then we'll go ahead and close. Do you have any recommendations for lung lung cancer screening? Oh yeah, we didn't we didn't talk about that, you know. So, and that's another one that obviously uh, I would, you know, our recommendation is now and I would certainly bring that up to your doctor if if you're over age 60 and you have a have you smoked more than 25 pack year years, which I by that we mean like if you smoke a pack a day for 25 years or two packs a day for 15 years, if you want more than that, then we would recommend low dose screening CT scans, which is um, you you don't get you know it's a CT scan, but you don't get as much radiation as you would with a normal CT scan, and that's been shown to pick up cancers early and prevent uh, and Again, with lung cancer, if you get it early and you you know treat it, you're more likely to be cured. Our rates, you know, we stage cancers by stage one, two, three, four. So, a stage one lung cancer, you know, probably a ninety percent cure rate. A stage two, maybe eighty percent. Stage three, you're look, you're dropping down to thirty percent, and stage four. Now we're curing some, but for all practical purposes, that was incurable. Know, 10 years ago. Uh, but we're, now we're in, we didn't even talk about immunotherapy, but now with immunotherapy, it's changed our treatment landscape for lung cancer. Okay. So, we yeah, guess, yeah. So if we're finished, I guess I hope I uh, answer a lot of questions, maybe raise more questions than answered. But, uh, you know, I appreciate listening and uh, appreciate your attendance. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining. If you have any more questions, feel free to submit and we will get them answered. You can email us. Um, and with that, be well. Thank you again, Dr. Husek. Thank you.